More than six centuries have passed since the fall changed era. Humanity struggles to rebuild after the cataclysm and the long winter that followed. With the hollow throne empty, the hundred kingdoms remain embroiled in intersign warfare as the nobility covets the remnants of the empire while the church grinds its teeth at the weakened orders. The city-states of the south struggle to recover from the collapse of their paradigms at the hands of demagogues and tyrants. To the north, the Nords have finally left behind the horrors of the Fimbul winter and the rule of the Yontar and have started expanding from their shattered realms. They turn their covetous eyes to the rich lands of the south, lusting for revenge for their murdered gods. With mankind far from the glory and might of its old dominion, the enigmatic spires exert their power for the first time in eons. Shedding millennia of custom and practice, the merchant princes seek the wealth of the lesser races in an effort to break the stranglehold of power the dictatorate and the sovereign house exert. As the vicious games of these elders spill into the mortal realm, misery and warfare sp spread like a disease from their domains. While the clamor of war spreads, the wisest among those living fear the rising of the Degholm. Deep in their holes they hear the clamor of battle approaching and feel the pulse quicken in their veins. They are the eldest disciples of war, the last time their hosts marched to battle, the eternal reign of dragons came to an end, and a conflict so violent the land itself withdrew. Far to the east, darkness is gathering, the fearless tribes hurl themselves against the Kostrine gates as their lands shrink. Their warbands are unable to contend with the ancient evil that stirs in what was once the heartland of the Old Dominion. Genesis while the points of view and flavor differ, we continue to find the same repeating factors in all Genesis mythologies. A force of creation and a force of destruction held in check by a third force, one of balance, usually presented as the ideal. In all my research, I have yet to encounter a single religion or syncretic system of belief that deviated from the same pattern, and indeed one could, one could piece together the same cosmogony tale from teachings of distant or even opposing religions. Sophidus, a rational fate, 482 PR. Before the breaking, one was all, and all was at peace, for the purpose is one. Thus was in the beginning, and so will the end be. All day, all ideas, all perceptions, all states of existence, so in the endless prospects of one, its own absence was perceived, and the concept of none was born. So now one had become two. One that makes and one that takes, one that creates and one that destroys. They both were flawed in their vision and execution, for no part can perceive all. Of the two, the creator, who was the memory of one, wished to remake it, yet it destroyed it further with each creation. The destroyer would try to achieve none, for it was born from its perception, and yet its works led towards all being one once more, and the two were locked in eternal struggle within themselves and with each other, creating and destroying for ages immeasurable until the illumination of the third, who shows that all can exist within the one. From the teachings of Icalandrus, recognize father aspect incarnate of the deists, Circa 348 PR. And the mismatched twins fought for eons, blindly creating and destroying realities that Theos never intended to exist. Where passion ruled and sin was spread in all of their dimensions, this lasted for uncounted eternities before Theos, father of all, was finally angered and his anger poured into the mismatched. It was Theos' anger that made creation weaker, a warrior finally wound destruction. And it was Theos' anger that finally allowed destruction, ever stronger but never strong enough, to return the blow and shatter his twin. And the Lord heard one's wailing and saw the other shattered, and his mercy was made manifest. Creation remained shattered, subduing to its rightful ruler's will, but destruction saw weakness in mercy and did not see the will behind it. And he mocked and challenged Theos, this futile blasphemy enraged the Almighty. Then the Lord's mercy and the Lord's anger came together and in his justice shone radiant and burned brightly all over creation. 
Our Lord fell upon destruction and cursed him for eternity and called him Belzul, the accursed, and made him kneel before smiting him and strangled him forever, bringing him pain eternal. Nova Fides, Principium, 3, 8 with 18, Holy Book of the Theist Church. Lie with me, said she, and took her brother in her arms, and with words he liked he put his mind to slumber. And when his black eyes closed, Nen struck. Slowly she strengthened her embrace at first, fearful of waking him. But as Antuk fell deeper and deeper into slumber, firmer and firmer her hold would become, then harsher, then strangling, building layers upon layers of stone and metal shackling her sibling. All her might it took even though still he slumbered, but in the end her first creation formed. Nenea is her name, the womb that will give birth to destruction at the end of time, but in the tongues of men they call her Ea. The prison, some say it means, the field, say others, while others still say home, for the tongues of men are many. And yet Nen's task was still not over. From her place in the darkness of the well, she looked around and saw the pieces of the Evermaker drawing closer, for he too is an eternal as his brother. Move, she then commanded, and from her word her first child, Ronu, the dancer, ever moving, was born. He rushed from her mouth and set upon the blackness of the well, laughing and running, grabbing and shoving, making Kunz's pieces to dance and throw, unable to untie till the end of his dance. Time, men call him, and fear him as a runner, but for his dance the cosmos would cease for all but the spawn. The tale of coming, told by Shakhir, the limbing, passed down to him by Kushzar, the eyeless, and to him by Zekhal, the maimed, and by all the flawed before them, mouth to ear, since the birth of the Natali people before the old dominion of stars and the night menagerie. The night's menagerie. Long before Hazila was molded into the Pantocrator, or the gods of Yggdrasil sheltered the mortals of Mannheim from the predations of the Yontar, perhaps even before the spires, Dwegholm, and the lesser primordial shards convinced humanity as anything but entertaining primates, humanity had pondered about its place in the cosmos. Lightning was feared, fire was worshipped, rain was venerated, and the sun was adorned for its light and warmth. But when the night was clear and the skies dark, the stars were looked upon with awe and wonder, igniting the fledgling's race's imagination and inspiring tales that would endure for thousands of years. Animals, faces, and personified power slowly claiming a place in the night sky, and before long the silent skies became as vibrant and as full as the world around the first humans. Dominant among them and constantly appearing in lore across the continent at all times of humanity's presence are twelve constellations that follow that circle the world of Ea. Many modern scholars debate that the true recognition and cataloging of the celestial menagerie did not really take place until the first tribe's evolution. The primary argument is that the celestial circle faithfully reflects the early pantheon of the Old Dominion, with twelve signs mirroring the twelve primary deities of Hazila's entourage. This argument, however, ignores the fact that Hazila was ever ready to use well-established patterns and beliefs, repurposing them to his own designs. Much like the proverbial chicken and egg, it is impossible to tell if the circle was convinced after the pantheon or if the Pantheon was founded to reflect an observed pattern. In fact, plenty of evidence would suggest that the skies had been observed and the movement of celestial bodies understood long before the ascension of the Old Dominion. Many of the proto-tribes that Hazelia's faithful would come to conquer or assimilate had already placed their own gods in the designs of the night sky, while the consistency and repetition of similar observations can only attest to some distant but common heritage that was reshaped and reimagined as the torch of this knowledge was passed down to generations. Regardless of the origin, the reality remains that the celestial circle, also known as the Knight's Menagerie, the Twelve of Skies, the Zodiac Ring, and other similarly poetic names, appears in almost all human civilizations of the continent of Surortris and Mannheim, and only them. 
The Duenkom show little interest in the observation of skies, save for navigation during campaigns, while the spires dismiss such patterns as superficialities of primates. Even the Waradun seem to place little interest in them, save for practical ones that will be explored later, and although the cult of famine has many stories to tell about the stars, they do not place as much of an existential significance to them as humans do. For the humans, on the other hand, the Knight's Menagerie is a source of scientific inspiration, occult studies and superstitious beliefs alike. It is perhaps not hard to understand why. There are three primordial aspects, creation, destruction and balance, and four elements, fire, earth, water and air, and twelve is the number to represent all possible combinations. In fact, simplified versions of the zodiac symbol are often employed by practitioners to symbolize an element as its aspect. Regardless, many modern scholars reject this correlation as fabricated, and instead astromancy is widely considered superstitious nonsense by most educated people. However, not all agree with this assessment. With the gilding paradigm of in the heavens as it is on air, astronomancy is by many considered a legitimate field of study, one that does not require the gift and a myriad self-proclaimed astromancers claim to be able to predict the future and unravel one's fate through the, through the art. Whispering into the ears of farmers and sovereigns alike more often than the latter would ever care to publicly admit. Such practices, of course, are readily dismissed by the chapters themselves. Through astronomancy, chapter mages claim exists, it is true. It is the understanding of likely primordial and elemental influences, but it cannot in any way actually predict the future, as such distant celestial influences can easily be overwhelmed by ones much more elusive and much more closer to the person or historical time. If a newborn soul is to be influenced in the first place, for instance, being born close to a centuries-old cemetery amidst a raging lightning storm, or simply while a violent murder or an embrace of true love is taking place nearby, such events are more likely to achieve said influence than the menagerie sign that happens to be dominant at the time. Thus much like in the art of decks and card reading, while academically the gift is not required to understand its theory, its practice both demands and truly benefits those with primeval understanding of such influences, one available only to those sensitive to them through the gift. Most chapters in fact do teach astronomy as supplementary course, with the pool of stillness being considered the best on the field. Their teachings however focus on ensuring stable spellcasting despite primordial influences rather than on individuals or historical events. The most common names of the signs along with their old dominion, Nord and city-state names are as follows. The Fallen Hammer, Maleus, Mjolnir or Thor dropped it. Sphira, a hammer falling or crushing on a cluster of stars, sign of the crafter, creational fire, fate. The rigid coins, Numi, Mimir, or head floats in well, Dikephalos, two heads mirroring back turned to each other, sign of the Magi, creational earth, science. The idol scales, Squame, Farmdar, or lost boatman, Aliefs. A set of balanced scales or a boat with open sail inverted. Sign of the seer slash the mage. Creational water. Opinion. The sky hunter. Venator. Vedit Mardar. Or hunter in the sky. Kinigos. A bowman in the air. String drawn. Arrow noshed. Sign of the wanderer. Creational air. Experience. The sun's lion. Leon. Kotor. Or cat of the heavens. Teforos, a regal winged feline depicting with a crown or mane, sign of the ruler slash the bureaucrat, balance fire, intellect. The embraced calf, pastor, kafur, or calf of the, to the market. Zudhohos, a calf being lifted by two hands embracing it, sign of the mother, creational earth, sense. The guarding one, Bellator, nice, Valkyrie or shield maiden, Aspidiforos. A figure clad in armor, shield before it, sign of the night, balance water, reason. The ego unchained, expemptus, I can't pronounce this one, or breaker of chains, ethos, 
an eagle flying away, breaking a chain on its legs. Sign of the untamed, balanced air, imagination. The loving doves, columbe, hrfnari, or kissing crows, peristeres. Two doves slash birds, neck touching as if embracing. Sign of the lover, destruction fire, passion. The wheat field, pila, veticar, or field of wheat, dohrifori. A field of wheat or rows of spears in the sky. Sign of the soldier slash the everyman. Destruction earth. Obligation. The offered lamb. Hostia. Ogledi or crying without name. Atoitis. A lamb head placed on an altar. Sign of the victim slash the innocent. Destruction water. Sacrifice. The dancing peacock. Pavo. Fiedahamr. Or cloak of feathers. Taos. A peacock tail or a man dancing in feathered cloak. Sign of the fool slash the trickster. Destructional air. Eagle. There are endless other constellations outside of the circle that dominate the night skies of Ea, which have ignited the imagination of nearly all its civilizations. Few remain as consistent or as widely recognized, however, and their study would be more relevant within individual cultural premises. One, however, cannot talk of the skies over Ea without mentioning the veil, the wisp, and the gap. It is a fact known to few, say for actual astronomers, that Ea's sky has in fact two layers. One is formed by the distant stars. It is there where the constellations are formed. The other, called the curtain or the veil, is much closer, formed by the breeze of the war of the hosts, is an extremely thin spherical layer of fine primordial dust which covers the entirety of the planet. In daytime, the layer is practically invisible, although the proximity of Ea's sun would have been felt much more were it not for this layer. In nighttime, glimpses of this layer can be seen at random, as spots of the veil momentarily glitter in the night sky, giving life to what is known as the wisps, willow stars, starflies, or a host of other names. If tradition is to be believed, one can summarize that it is by condescending parts of that layer or gathering its biggest pieces that Hazila was able to build his Elysium over the world, which in turn will later cause the brunt of the destruction of the fall, and were it not for the interference and sacrifice, a Ninhua would have annihilated all life on Ea. Still, Hazila's interference and his subsequent fall have left a gap in that layer. It is this which causes the day of Yudika, where the sun's light seems to burn brighter. The Yudika cannot be predicted save but on the very morning it is happening, and sometimes not even then, but closer to noon. When observed, however, all activity stops, windows are barred, roads are emptied, and people move not unless they have to. No matter what one's beliefs are, the Yudika, even if differently named and explained, is respected and feared. Even the city-states hold this day as a bad omen, and citizens are urged to stay indoors. The Weaver Courts Far to the west of the Hundred Kingdoms, across the Kairangal Range, to the north and the Bitter Sea to the south, lies a primeval land where the calls of exotic birds and ceaseless rustles of leaves marks the edge of man's domain. Deep within these lands, known to its inhabitants as the Feran, the Weaver Courts, ancient cousins of the spires hold sway, split into four seasonal courts, spring, summer, autumn, and winter, these great exile nations could not be more different. Where the spires turn their back on the innate gift of life-binding and perverted it into biomancy, the weavers revere it, using it to shape almost every aspect of their culture. Where the spires look upon Ea as a sacrificial staging point for their successful return to their home world, the weavers look upon Ea as a divine gift and take their duty to nurture and protect it very seriously indeed. Children of a lost world and inheritance of a Rivian society, the exiles who left the spires under protection of the eldest dragons chose to abandon everything they knew, everything they carried and walk upon Ea, giving freely of those gifts they possessed in exchange for the chance to peacefully sample those gifts the planet shared with them. 
under the tutelage of the dragons, perhaps the only beings more fascinated with life on Ea than they themselves were, the exiles soon began to appreciate the complexity of the tapestry of life upon Ea. These exiles soon took a new name, Weavers, to represent their new calling, taking upon themselves the honors to heal the damage they had caused to the planet with their arrival. The main tool they used for this was their innate gift of life binding. Capable of binding the life force of two beings together, the Weavers quickly began to bond with the planet they sought to succor. Breaking an age-old taboo, they soon started mingling their own essence with those of the local environment, taking upon themselves the traits of local flora and fauna, while gifting them with some of their own awareness and sentience in return. A physical description of a member of the Weaver Court is categorically impossible. Each member of the Weaver Court has embraced the gift of life-binding, bonding with at least one of other living beings, changing irrevocably. One can walk past the beautiful autumn court maiden, whose eyes are the gentle round brown orbs of a doe, whose hair is a riot of thorns and roses, yet walks up upright upon the cloven hooves of a goat as she converses with the lean man of the court of spring, whose neck and upper body is covered in vibrant feathers and ends in, parrot, in a parrot's head, but whose legs are covered in a fine fur but shaped in the talons of a raptor. Standing next to these ones, my, one might witness an ancient of, of autumn who has repeatedly bound with the same groove of trees, becoming a towering humanoid figure encased in moss, bark, and forest detritus, who speaks with a voice like a hundred breaking branches. Even stranger, one might lay eyes on a member of one of the high courts. These are the mystical and spiritual leaders of the Weaver Court who have somehow managed to use their life-binding gift to bond with the elemental forces of Ea itself, manifesting flame corona of fire instead of hair, clothing forged of frost and snow, or claws and scales formed from pure obsidian, and other even more exotic displays of power. Each court is associated with an element. Water for spring, fire for summer, water for autumn, and air for winter. An unusual large amount of summer and winter court members possess elemental bindings, a fact that oft often causes the two courts to see themselves as more worthy than the courts of autumn and spring, a common source of contention between them. It would not be wrong to consider each court within Weaver society a small nation unto itself with its own culture, goals, social mores, and rules. Competition amongst the court is fierce and is not unknown to break into open warfare, particularly when members of the higher courts are involved. Much like the seasons must come and go, the power and influence of each court waxes and wanes over time. The court of spring has been ascended for centuries, flush with the victory and achievement of repairing the damage to the Feran that was caused by the fall, the long winter, and even the breaking. But I seem to be changing. Centuries of Enui have dulled the luster of their achievements, and other courts grow restless. Intrigues and plots are flying thick and heavy through the courts, and maneuvering has already begun to see which court shall rise and what agenda they shall pursue. Time on Ea It is not hard to understand why the fall would be a defining event in almost all civilizations on Ea. More so human civilizations than others. While naturally the hundred kingdoms and the city-states can track their very birth to this calamity, the Nords have readily adopted it to be, be, be it because of their lack of record-keeping during the reign of the Yontar, or because of the limitations of their oral tradition, which largely disregards the accurate study of history and focuses more on deeds. In the Hundred Kingdoms, it would take some time for the calendar to settle. The first effort to keep track of the time would differ from one group of Old Dominion refugees to another, as they usually attempted to count days based on their own escape. As the group started gathering on the shores of the Bitter Sea, however, the abbreviations AR ante ruinam, and PR post ruinam, would come to be used as a common reference point between everyone signifying the years before or after the fall respectively. Still, while this counting first appeared long before the Telian Empire, it would take the first emperor to establish it as a standard measure of time. 
It has since been referred to as the Imperial Calendar, when for the first time the abbreviations became official and used by the state in all provinces. In short, this is how the Emperor counted years. The Thais Church agrees with the Imperial Calendar, however it uses the abbreviation AS and PS, ante slash post sacrificium, the phrase in the year of redemption or in the year of penance, followed by the current year, is often used in correspondence and record keeping, a practice adopted by most of the nobility, especially in formal situations. Similarly, deists have adopted the imperial creed, however specific aspect worshippers may use different calendars based on the latest incarnations of an aspect. These variations are too many, too limited in use, and often too short-lived to merit future exploration. The Rus adopted the imperial calendar in their dealings with the other kingdoms, but in their official records they refer to year 7 PR as year 0 Briss, or without. It should perhaps be noted that the Rus considered that the fall happened on 2 PR and the imperial calendar is wrong by 2 years. Most Rus nowadays do not know what the original phrase was. Some claim it implies without teos, while others claim it means without sin, without pain, or without struggle. The imperial calendar has 12 months each, with 30 days. These, however, do not compile a full year, for there are an extra 12 days. These do not belong to any month, but are simply referred to as God days. While all the kingdoms share this format, the names of the months of course differ according to the language or dialect of a specific cultural group. In Treyspeak, however, the names of the months are the following, starting from the first of the year, Janus, Febus, Martius, Apuas, Mea, Jux, Jul, Augustus, Setua, Otus, Noctima, Decarpus. After the Carpus, the, good, the God days come, 12 in number, but for every 5 years, in the so-called Tall Years, the God days are 13 and they are generally considered years of bad luck. The 7 days of the week in the kingdoms, in the kingdoms are, in Trispeak, the following, Preda, Dueda, Welda, Terda, Freta, Gonda, and Sondus. While local customs and different beliefs have different holidays, some days are recognized throughout the kingdoms. Deida and Prima, the last and the first days of the year, for instance, are always holidays. Every spring, usually during Martius and Apuas, or Apuas, the fall is commemorated in 12 days. For the Paenticum, these are the days spent in prayer by Theos' chosen, before his sacrifice. The first nine days are days of fasting and contemplation. On the tenth day, the Catena, he was chained to the materialistic world of men so that he could sacrifice himself to save them. It is a day of mourning when long processions march slowly from every chapel and church carrying their sacred relics for the world to see, accompanied by beautiful sad music that echoes on the streets of, of, of every faithful city. The eleventh day, called Ruina, is a day of death, and the faithful are not permitted to eat or drink anything but water, or and the simple, tasteless soup when the sun sets. Cemeteries fill on Ruina, as the people visit the graves of their departed and offer flowers, while a statue of wood is built on every temple's bell tower. On the stroke of midnight, under cheerful bells, the statues are lit and thrown on a field of flowers beneath. And the twelfth day, Nova brings, begins the new day, when the faithful escape the fall and offer humanity hope and a new beginning. Folkloric traditions, adopted in part by the deists, tells another tale, naming the days and the echoes of names of their old god, Drekch, the day when the beast of Ea cowered. Nabus, when empty was the seat of, the se of a seer. Doda, came and two to none lowered. Ferus, and only barbarians now cheer. Dionus, no good luck can anyone save. Festos, the day when God's hammer starts forging. Cleon, when way a knight's broken shield gave. Hazila, skies darken from all father falling. Vagero, is now worshipped, wonders all. Nunc, soldiers and victims, now everyone's peers. Ishamos, two split in ones in heartbroken calls. Ninuach, mother's body, her children in tears. Till ash and cloud move to a new morning clear. O ash and cloud move, bring a new morning clear. 
This song is sung by the Deus Faithful, and instead of one, twelve statues of aspects are built in a circle. While the forms and names of these may differ from tradition to tradition, the twelfth is always that of Ninwach, the mother aspect. Counting down to midnight, the statues are set on fire one by one. Tradition says that unless all statues keep burning, Ninwa is lit, it signifies a bad omen given by the aspect whose statue flames died out. Heroica, the midnight summer day, has been celebrated as High Sun, but it was thus named and established by the Italian Empire as a day of memory to the fallen in combat, commemorated in many kingdoms with tourneys and games. This holiday falls at the end of Jukes and marks the longest day of the year. The Paneticum also celebrates the same day as Sacrema, the day when Theos he hears prayers clearer than ever. In contrast to Heroica, the unexpected holiday of Utica is a moving holiday with regular intervals. This, however, is not a day of celebration. Utica is a day of judgment, when Theos' angry eye is turned on Ea, judging all sins harshly, no matter how small, as he is reminded of the fall of his herald. This event occurs when the sun's light seems to burn brighter, as if a pale shadow is lifted over it. The Utica cannot be predicted, save but on the very morning it is happening, and sometimes, not even then, but closer to noon. When observed, however, all activity stops. Windows are barred, roads are empty, and people move not unless they have to. No matter what one's beliefs are, the Utica, even if differently named and explained, is respected and feared. Even the city-states hold this day as a bad omen, and citizens are urged to stay indoors. If their epistomos have explained the natural phenomenon, they have not shared their observations, but endorsed traditions nonetheless. While the imperial calendar has very much been adopted by the Nords when it comes to the counting of years before and after the fall, the similarities on timekeeping end there. The Nords divide the year into seasons, winter and summer, based on the movement of the sun. They further divide the year into four sub-seasons, as it were, or spells. Howler and Long White usually come in winter, one signified by the rise of northern winds, the other by the fall of heavy snow. In summer usually come run water and sail, the first signified by the partial melting of snow, the other announcing that the weather is good enough for raids to start. The spells, however, are not stable, and their comings announced by high Gothi, shamans and ship captains, judging by the weather. It is not unheard of, and in fact more common than not, that any of the sub-seasons last only for only a few weeks, or even completely skipped. This makes for an extremely flexible system, which can vary even between neighboring settlements. For more precision, the Nords count the weeks of a season 26 for summer and 27 for winter. This, their week days are Maningur, Tirigur, Wundegur, Torgur, Freigur, Einherdag, and Sondag. Holidays are rare in the north, and many seasonal celebrations have merged naturally with the commemoration of significant events. The Night of the Burning Tree is celebrated a few days before the end of the year when a heavily decorated tree in the village square is set on fire to dispel the darkness and coldest night of the year. It is not hard to see how the memory of Yggdrasil is kept alive, turning one of the most tragic events in their history into a message of endurance, if not hope. The liberation from the rule of the Yontar and the coming of the Einhar, Einjar, whatever, is commemorated along with the coming of Runwater, usually a few weeks after the coming of summer. If the weather is kind enough, from the day summer starts until its announcement, the Valkyries, or women dressed as Valkyries, where there are none, stand before the great hall of the settlement and ask loudly, Is it today? Are the chosen awake? If silence is their response, they will howl sadly, banging their weapons together to awake Einherjar. If Runwater has arrived, then the village elder will sound the village horn. Soon all horns in the village will sound, with the Valkyries joining in with happy war cries. The two weeks after are, are spent in preparation, feasting and work, with kids dressed as Einjahar playing pranks upon their elders. At the end of those weeks, aspiring youths will depart to join the Kap Agorask, the proving grounds where their metal will be proven, proven and their future will be decided. High Sun is the last common holiday of the Nords, celebrated during the biggest day of the year. 
While the day is filled with music, feasting and merriment, spouses of warriors that have joined the raids are expected to stand near the shore or the edge of the settlement, holding candles for their loved ones to find their way home. It is speculated that all spires keep two calendars, one counting the years since their exodus to Ia and another counting the days of operations of each spire. Findings suggest that in some documents a third way of keeping time, this time backwards, may be used. All of the above, however, are mere theories, as the inscriptions of the Spire Lords are yet to be fully deciphered, and even the merchant princes never share information about their people and instead mimic the calendars of the humans they trade with. Since Dwekholm, memories are perfect and because of the art of Mnemasi, It could be argued that they do not actually need any kind of calendar, save for everyday use or a quick reference point. In a way, that is true. When it comes to referring to the past, the Dwekholm simply divided time in campaigns. The Dragon War is the first campaign, followed by the Memory Wars, and then the Exile Campaign, etc. Anything before that is simply referred to as the Nedweg, a time before the Dweg home when accurate time keeping and recounting of events have neither meaning nor importance to the Dweg home save for the insults suffered by their former masters. The Derhugold, the memory of the descendant to war's prison, stands alone in history, an event and time separate from anything else. Perhaps a division one can discern in Dwegholm timekeeping is the rule. Living lives distance from seasons or any celestial observations, days, seasons, and even years means nothing to a hold. Instead, time is divided into rules, referring to a hold's ragged rule or the absence of one. In human counting, a rule could last for periods ranging from weeks to centuries. For the Dwegholm, these lengths don't matter. The Rahik's name is sufficient, the rest is remembered. Further divisions are simple and practical, more than intentional timekeeping in a hold. A rule's length, varying as it may be, is usually measured in commands, meaning the rotation of the same ranking officers as supervisors of the next 12 duty rosters. Rosters in turn mean the assignment of 12 duties to the soldiers and each duty is divided into 12 watches. When it comes to comparing the human way of thinking, these divisions are not as alien and not unlikely because of some influence between the two races, possibly pre-fall humans adopting Dwegholm military habits. Much like in most human militaries, a Dwegholm watch is approximately 2 hours long. Since the duty is 12 watches, this means a similar 24 hour day for a Dwegholm as well. The similarities end there, however, as the Dwegholm divide everything in 12s. Command, Month has 12 rosters, weeks, which has 12 duties, days, which has 12 watches, hours, or rather 2 hours. This of course presents a problem, since the different holds have different rules, commands would be impossible to discern, so one could not communicate a specific point in time of Dweg home of another hold. First, there is one thing that one must understand, and that is that the Dweg home do not care. Time holds no meaning to them the way it does to humans. If precise information has to be shared between holds, the memnancers will make it happen. If two holds meet and or cooperate during a campaign against a third party, the ups and downs of the sun are good enough to coordinate their timing of attacks, for instance. These are sufficient for dwell home communication. For the rarest of exceptions, when it is not, the Dwegholm count back to the first watch of the first campaign against the dragons. It is only the stable point in time, as watches have since run uninterrupted for every hold, clan or even platoon, and each hold's involvement in a campaign may have differed. In layman's terms, whatever the exact common date today for all Dweg home is, it's over a billion watches, although it is possible that duties, rosters and commands are also used in that regard, themselves running uninterrupted since. Shards of the Primordials From the highest heavens down to the darkest pits where destruction and his servants are bound, primordial powers infuse the world of Ea. The most extreme of these manifestations are the horsemen themselves as aspect souls of creation and destruction. Bound and chained by the dragons, they nonetheless represent the most powerful primordial essences at play, but they are far from the only. When creation and destruction fought at the dawn of existence, each blow struck through and cast the essence of these two primordial powers throughout the cosmos. 
The greatest of these are the stars themselves, raging shards of creation cast into the heavens when destruction smote its sibling with a blow so powerful that shattered its very body into a million, million pieces. Likewise, creation's original blow, the one that incited destruction to its rage, was a deep cut that has bled incessantly since it was made. The larger fragments, those that possess enough power and essence to retain consciousness, are powerful entities capable of extraordinary feats of primordial magic. They range in power from full-fledged gods and primordial dragons down to the meanest demons and cherubims in the primordial hosts. Smaller motes of this primordial essence are just that, motes. They lack any motive energy or volition, wafting through the cosmos with no aim or reason. Thick physical barriers can impede their progress, resulting in a slow accretion of these motes within an area. The most common manifestations of this are the countless exotic stones and metals that one can find on Ea. It is no coincidence that the deeper one digs, the more of these minerals are found, as the powerful essence of destruction suffices the stone and molten lava. On the other hand, the essence of creation is much harder to come across in a solid form, diffused as it is through the cosmos. The likeliest sources are extraterrestrial objects such as meteors and space dust, which becomes infused eons ago. Unlike solid matter, life retains an unusual capacity to trap these moods. In small concentrations, they do little more than affect the mood or outlook of the life form. In higher concentrations, though, they can start creating gro gross physical changes on the form of their host. Most of the creatures considered normal by humans on Ea and named as animals, rabbits, deer, ox, wolves, etc., are of a balanced aspect and do not possess a high concentration of these modes. Humanity itself is considered to possess a balanced aspect, and as a result, those creatures that are aspected away from balance towards either creation or destructions, humans instinctively find unnatural and call monsters. Whatever the case, these modes seem to ignore the laws of physics as laid down by balance. They seem to respond to eddies and currents that have nothing to do with the physical realm, being drawn to areas and events that embody their chosen aspect most strongly. These modes can help aspect an entire area, aligning it with their primordial paradigm. This is why a particularly famous battlefield might become the site of future battles for no discernible reason, or a particular building once inhabited by a creative genius might become a midwife's home or nursing ward. One of the more curious properties of these modes is not only that they are drawn to common areas, but that they possess the ability to merge when chance forces them together. In a powerful enough aspected locus, enough of these motes can come together to grant the amalgam a rudimentary instinct. These slivers will start seeking out smaller pieces to incorporate into their growing form. As more primordial power gathers, sentience slowly develops. These awakened primordial slivers are small manifestations of creation and destruction which often settle within their locus. All sentient races on Ea are familiar with these manifestations. The dragons would let them be until they reach a critical size, after which point they would be hunted and destroyed. The exiles, strangers to our world, have a very limited ability to interact with these spirits. The spires view them with extreme caution, and through a long process of trial and error, have learned to catalog them and use them on infused flesh to grant unique and abilities to their creations that could not have been achieved otherwise. The Weaver Courts, on the other hand, venerate these beings as manifestations of the will of Ea. The most devoted and insightful amongst the Summer and Winter Courts have found ways of using their life-binding abilities to merge with these existences, assuming the role of leaders and sorcerers amongst their kin. The Quiet venerate them and cherish them as byproducts of primordial balance, but otherwise ignore them. The Dwegholm, ever practical and focused on their martial pursuits, have taken a different track. Lacking the raw primordial might of their dragon creators, the Tempered have long captured these beings to power the constructs the dragons left behind, while the Ardent reduce and distill their physical forms into pigments and minerals that are incorporated into their armor and bodies to aid their martial prowess. Humanity, on the other hand, found a different use for these slivers. Worship. And this is our first 
dive in into Parabellum's Conquest, the Argument of Kings, or Conquest, First Blood, whichever one you prefer. And to be honest, I... I like this one, it's pretty cool, to be honest. It, it, it feels interesting, has elements of space and magic and fantasy to it, so I'm all up for it. If you reach this point in the video, please remember to like, comment, subscribe, rate, you know, the usual. It helps the channel grow. I'll see you in the next one. Arrivederci.